Hi, this is Steve, and I want to welcome you back to the Tech Leader Talk podcast. You've probably heard about IQ and EQ, but have you heard about experiential intelligence? That's what I'm discussing today with my guest, Soren Kaplan, who wrote the book on experiential intelligence, literally. The book is titled Experiential Intelligence, Harness the Power of Experience for Personal and Business Breakthroughs. Soren has been named one of the world's top management experts. He's advised and led professional development programs for thousands of executives around the world, including Disney, NBC Universal, Medtronic, Philips, and Cisco. Soren's mission is to inspire, educate, and empower individuals and organizations to harness the power of innovation and experiential intelligence for positive impact and growth. During our discussion, Soren explains how experiential intelligence can complement IQ and EQ, and he also talks about how to build a culture of innovation in your organization, which is a topic of one of his previous books. I'm sure you're going to get value from this discussion and pick up some insights about experiential intelligence and how you could start using that uh, in your own life and in your own business. So here's my discussion with Soren. Hey, Soren. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Great to be here, Steve. So, so I gave the guests a little intro uh, about kind of your background and some of the things you've you've done uh, over your career so far. Tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get to the the kind of work that you're doing today, especially kind of the innovation, the idea behind the new book, kind of that? What does that journey look like? Well, I'll, gi- I'll give you my professional uh, overview, and then as we get into talking about my new book a little bit later, I think we'll uh, I'll get into some of the personal uh, dimensions of that. But kind of on the kind of resume side of things, I um, have a background in organizational psychology, um, and then okay. I've run I ran the strategy and innovation group at Hewlett Packard HP in Silicon Valley, um, and then I've had a consulting firm for many years. I've probably worked with about thirty of the Fortune one thousand, a lot of tech companies, Cisco and Disney and NBC Universal and Colgate mm-hmm. and Kimberly Clark and kind of the list goes on. Um, and then I've worked with a lot of leaders, um, probably tens of thousands of leaders speaking and doing leadership development. And um, these days I'm running a software company uh, that um, helps leaders be more effective through technology. And I do leadership development um, with teams to make techn- technical, you know, kind of tech tech teams much more effective through some of the, know, the softer side of, of how you how you might approach team building and leadership. Okay. That's interesting. This would be fun to kind of dive into some of those things. And I want to mention your book just a little bit initially and, and then kind of talk a little bit about your experience with innovation, which is important to all tech companies, especially. Um, and then we can come back to the book a little bit more and, and what exactly it is and how, how that's making an impact. So, the book is your latest book is called Experiential Intelligence, and it talks about the need to for companies and people to thrive in today's disruptive world. What are some of the big disruptions that you're seeing today? I can guess at them, but I'll let you uh, <laughs> say what what are the big ones that are to, to learn about and that are that are making an impact now and in in the coming years. Yeah, you know, disruptions uh, kind of a, a, a overused term these days, but I think it's still <laughs> apt because things are changing so fast. Yeah. Um. You know, I, I look at disruptions in terms of technology, business, and people. Um. So on the technology side, I mean, obviously, Chat GPT and artificial intelligence, large language models, um, have kind of come onto the scene and really disrupted things in the last few months. Um, but, you know, you have a lot of other disruptors out there in terms of technology, you know, cloud and 3D printing and, you know, just a whole host of augmented reality, a whole host of technologies that are changing how we, you know, interact with with products and services. On the business side, those technologies are really revolutionizing business models and kind of the products and services and how we, you know, generate value for customers and consumers, but also value for the business. And then on the people side, there's disruption happening there too, because people need to adapt and adopt those technologies individually as consumers, but also in our workplaces 
Um, we have to figure out how to use technology to do our work. And I cannot uh, not mention COVID because, you know, our whole pandemic truly disrupted um, how people, I think, approach the world, our mindsets, our values, and how we approach business. Um, and how we, you know, are, are interacting in the workplace and even thinking about going to work versus working at home. So you have a whole host of intersecting disruptive events and trends, technology, business people that have really changed the face of how we operate in society and in business. Okay. So how, just in a general sense, how do companies and people stay on top of these disruptions? Because they seem to change frequently. It was just a year, year and a half ago from the time we're recording this. Cryptocurrency and everything, that was kind of all the the rage and getting all the headlines. Um, and it's just been within the last few months that it's been artificial intelligence. And that's that's obviously going to make a big impact. It, it seems like there's a new cycle or something new coming every, every 12, 18 months. How do you stay on top of it? Or do you just kind of focus on some of the more underlying trends that are going to probably have a longer term impact? Well, I mean, I think it's it's a it's a lot of both of those. Um, you know, the the speed of change has accelerated. So what that means is we need to adopt to that speed and understand which technologies are going to be more valuable short term and then into the longer term. So you know the the AI and and some of the tools there are you know on the forefront of everybody's mind today. And so the question is, how do we experiment with that technology as quickly as possible to figure out what the value is for how we can be more efficient and effective as teams, but also how do we serve customers better, whether they're internal customers, if we're in a, you know, an, an IS group, um, how do we serve our internal customers or external customers as well? And so I, I think that understanding, you know, what hasn't changed is from an innovation angle, meeting customer problems and addressing customer problems in creative ways, that's innovation. Applying emerging technology in new in ways that address those existing as well as changing problems is really where innovation comes from. And so that okay. experimentation, that iteration is really, really key to that. Okay. So a lot of companies have heard it said by, I don't know who probably said it first, but tech companies often live or die by innovation and staying kind of at the on, on the cutting edge or the bleeding edge, whatever you want to call it. What how do these tech companies with with these disruptions, how would you talked about it a little bit, but how do they kind of integrate analyzing and trying to implement disruptive technologies into their regular business? Do they chase everyone that comes along or do they do, how do you analyze it? How do they decide what's worth spending some time and money on seeing if that could provide a better result to their customers. Yeah, um you know the the idea that disruption is constant I think is pretty well accepted these days we've all felt it in so many different ways. Yeah. Um so the question is what is the source of sustainable innovation and competitive advantage? Is there one? And you know my argument in my previous book is that it's creating a culture of innovation, which basically means how do you as a leader, let go of the need to believe we have all the answers, let go of absolute kind of control over exactly how that business strategy unfolds in this quarter of the year and allow for others in on our teams and in the organizations to embrace different ways of innovating and experimentation and, you know, meeting those customer needs. So, you know, being able to very clearly understand what are the different types of innovation that exist out there? So are, are we going after and setting the guardrails for the your, your team, your organization? Are we going after the disruption? Or maybe we just need to do some, you know, incremental innovations to improve what we currently have and that's okay. So being able to provide a frame of you know strategic intent for your teams is important. Um, and then also being able to you know provide sponsorship, provide the coaching, provide you know the 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 type of support that teams need in order to feel like they can take some safe risks, if you will, and try okay. things out. Okay. 
So you just mentioned some kind of interesting looking at disruptive innovations versus maybe incremental. And as a patent attorney, I see lots of inventions and you know, the majority of them are, are incremental. They're they're not, not completely brand new, but they, they're building. It's a new idea where they take a couple of different ideas and put them together in a new way. Does it matter what kind of industry a tech company is in, whether they, I mean, are there certain industries where you need to be disruptive? You need to really be out there pushing some brand new technologies. And then are there other ones, maybe more traditional, that it's just a little bit more incremental and just provide slow improvements for your on your products for your customers? It's a great question. And I think a lot of tech companies and leaders get overly enamored by the big shining disruption out there yeah. on the horizon. Now, it's you need to be aware of those disruptive technologies and the new business models and the competitors that might not be competitors today, but that will eat your lunch tomorrow. However, it, it is valuable to think about innovation as a portfolio. So, you know, the the Google introduced that 70 20 10 model where you know 10% of your time should be focused on the next disruption 20% is really about the next generation of what you're currently doing and then 10% is all the incremental stuff so if you're a leader in an organization whether it's a tech company or whatever other kind of company and also whether you're in a business function as a leader or you're running a business that you're serving external customers being able to be conscious of what percent of your mind share and resources and team is focused on the big disruptive thing that might take a few years to evolve or just the incremental blocking and tackling innovations that will allow us to be competitive right now with what we have. And if you're not clear about that, you either lean way too far into one direction and either you get disrupted or you don't get traction because you're going after the big disruption that, you know, might take too long for your yeah. sponsors and your resources to, to support that development. And that's, you know, that's that no, no person's land zone where you can, you can really run some risk as a leader yeah. in an organization. Okay. Well, and I suppose, as I have, worked with several of my clients who are using or applying uh, artificial intelligence in different ways. Some are taking an existing product and adding it to, to improve it or to streamline it or something. So I guess just because it's a disruptive technology doesn't mean it has to, I guess, disrupt your business. You could implement it on kind of a smaller scale or on an, take a disruptive idea, but implement it on an incremental scale and just kind of slowly add it without having to take everybody off their current projects and go chase this big crazy thing well it it I, I think it depends on how you view ai are you viewing ai yeah. as a product and as an engine for your own products that you need to incorporate and so that would be really wholesale reinvention of your own right. solutions using ai versus if you're you know operating in a certain way and you know you have a certain product and you're selling it or you're in a business function and you want to just use AI to be more effective, that may not necessarily kind of blow up your whole operating model. Yeah. So you know depending on how you will, what problems you're solving, what goals you have, who you're serving, it may make sense to really look at incremental versus disruptive and how to apply the technology in that way. Okay. So on a topic you've mentioned a couple of times already, and I know you've written about this, about the a culture of innovation, what are some of the basic steps? Suppose a company hasn't thought about it too much, or they just think that a culture of innovation will just happen automatically or happen by accident. What's If it's a small or medium-sized tech company and the leaders are listening and they want to do that, what? how do they get started? What should they first be thinking about to, to build that kind of a culture? Yeah, I think it's um, it, it's it can vary depending on um, the existing culture of the organization, sure. but there's a number of different success factors. Um, one is to really understand what kind of innovation are we going after. Um, I was just talking to a client a couple of days ago, and there's and they said we're a fast follower. We're not the disruptor. We're a fast follower. Okay. And so that that means that you're going to be doing certain things and not doing other things in terms of kind of early stage R and D and kind of ex explore, exploring. You're more kind of scanning the, the the market. So being able to set a frame: here's the kind of innovation we want. Here's the kind of portfolio of opportunities we're looking for, from disruptive to incremental, and then giving people tools 
So I, I've worked with a number of organizations that have created these toolkits. I wrote about something in Harvard Business Review where AAA Insurance created a toolkit for all, I think about 4,000 employees, and then just trained them on how to use the toolkit and apply it to come up with innovations from incremental to disruptive, depending on their role, so that they could generate ideas that then could be implemented in their own teams over the next year. So, you know, the tools and processes is, is important to provide to people. It could be very mm -hmm. loose, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a very rigorous process, but yeah. you know, the tools to innovate. Um, leadership can also tell stories to shape culture. So what is culture? Culture is the norms and values that people hold that shape behavior. Sometimes those norms and values are explicit. Sometimes they're implicit uh, and under the radar. But if leaders tell stories and find examples of great illustrations of the type of innovations yeah. they're looking for, tell the stories, talk about the behavior, talk about the people, what was done, those reinforce the types of values that you care about. And so people see leaders talking about that and those values, and then you get more of that. So there's some very subtle things. And then of course, there's all other things you can do like metrics. You know, how are you measuring your innovation? Is it, you know, the new markets you're into? Is it new products you're launching? Is yeah. it new revenue streams? So there's ways to which more, you know, if you're, if you're a kind of a, a engineering type of a mindset, you might want to define those metrics also. So, you know, that you're getting the innovation you're looking to get as well. Okay. So for those different options or the different ways of kind of helping stimulate innovation and kind of create that culture, how do you look at it? You say it can vary based on the existing culture. How does a company maybe decide the first step to take there? Do, do they have to look at their existing culture and or maybe see what they're doing, see where their innovations have been coming from in the past already? I um, I like to look at uh, successes. So, you know, okay. there's a lot you can do. I, I you know, I go in and I do culture audits and in kind of recommendations based on what people are, you know, where they're stuck as well as the, where they're okay. strong. But um, I, I think it could be very simple. Um, uh, one of the things I recommend leaders do is, is, and I ask this question in my, in my work, I say, you know, what are some great examples of innovation as you have seen it in the past or present and what have supported those innovations um, to become innovations? And yeah. so what you get from that question are the success factors that currently exist. And I'm big on leveraging strengths versus just trying to backfill all the gaps and weaknesses. So if you yeah. amplify what you're already good at, you're really leveraging your core competencies and kind of the strengths of your culture. I like to start there. Um, and then, of course, there, everybody always has gaps. So, you know, there might be some gaps in certain types of knowledge about certain innovation tools or, you know, design thinking processes or technology, and you can fill those gaps. But let's start with the strengths of what, you know, where we got to how we got to today. Okay. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, build, build on what's working. So let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about your, your latest book, uh, Experiential Intelligence. And you talk about the experiential intelligence kind of quotient or whatever you use the, the term XQ. What is that? I've heard of EQ and IQ, but this is new. Yeah. So we all, we all know IQ it's, you know, our, our intelligence quotient, you know, we get yeah. the score and it's very kind of quantifiable. Um, EQ over the last 30 years has risen to prominence and that's emotional intelligence, which is essentially, you know, another leadership success factor for how we can navigate the world is how, how are we, are, are we in touch with our own emotions or the emotions of others? Those are the two types of intelligence that have really gotten a hold um, of leadership in business in terms of kind of concepts we we recognize as important. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, in today's disruptive world where things are changing faster than ever, I, I just have not seen those two as sufficient. When you think about, you know, what leads to success, is it your IQ and your EQ? No, it's more than that. It's how you navigate uncertainty and ambiguity and learn from experience. And so my book, Experiential Intelligence, and that word experiential intelligence was coined by the 
uh, originally by the former president of the American Psychological Association to basically describe street smarts. You know, so the the things you gain from your personal experiences that then you apply in creative ways in new contexts. And that's experience. And so my my view is it's not just a, you know, XQ or experiential intelligence that's important. It's a combination of IQ, EQ, and experience that really gives leaders the ability to navigate today's disruptive world. Okay. Interesting. I've heard about experiential learning, and I guess that's, that's kind of similar that you, you can read in a classroom or watch a video on TV or on uh, YouTube, but if you're actually getting out and applying it in the real world, I guess that's how they train like doctors and so many other peoples and, you know, intern type programs uh, that, that can be a great learning. How does, so how does somebody go about obtaining or acquiring experiential intelligence? Well, by having experiences. So that okay. experiential learning is exactly right. So I, I'm going to, I'll distill it down into a super simple example. Okay. How did you, how did you learn how to ride a bike, Steve? How did you learn how to ride? A, did you read the manual? Nope. <laughs> no, fell you, off a you, lot of times. <laughs> you fell off. Right. So we put on training wheels. We might get some help from a parent or a you know family friend. We fall down. We may might take off a single training wheel and kind of keep trying. Yeah. Eventually, we learn the the base skills of steering, of braking, of turning, balance. Those are knowledge and skills about from our experiences. Well, we also learn higher order abilities. We learn how to navigate traffic or ride defensively in traffic. We learn how to anticipate potholes in the road, but we also develop mindsets around what is a bike? Is it just transportation or is it actually a way to explore new neighborhoods and adventure or is it for socializing? So we develop through the experiences we have mindsets, abilities, higher order abilities and base skills. And so you can look at, you gave your example of a surgeon, you know, a surgeon, I wouldn't want a a surgeon who's never only read the books to to work on me. I'd want someone who's had a lot of experience and those experiences deliver really base skills, abilities to understand kind of what's happening with the body and, 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 you know, in the operating room and then the mindsets around their confidence and their ability to kind of translate maybe one situation to the next in terms of the, the situation. It, it, it That same process applies to so many different contexts and so many different um, situations uh, in terms of what our, our experiences allow us to do. Now, one other little sidebar is that the same experiences that you might have riding a bike. Maybe you had great experience riding a bike. You love it. You think about it as expanding your so many possibilities in terms of using that bike in your life. I might have fallen over and been embarrassed in front of some friends and actually might have been a little traumatized from that. So I might actually view a bike as something that I'm shy of. Like I don't, I, okay. I look at it as a risk. I look at it as not something that I want to do very much because it connects to a painful experience. So those same experiences can impact different people in different ways, which, which in my view accounts for a lot of people's differences in risk tolerance, differences in ability to live with ambiguity, uncertainty. Even if people have had similar types of experiences, we internalize those differently. So there's a real psychological component to this. And if you understand yourself better in your experiences, and then you can understand where your strengths are, as well as maybe where your kind of subconscious um, limiters are, you really can up your leadership game significantly. Okay. How can a company leader start kind of integrating this idea into their business? Is that, that, do you talk about that in a book? Does it kind of have a, maybe a roadmap or some ideas for how to get a team on board? Yeah, I have a I have a chapter on teams. I have a chapter on organizational culture, yep. um, for sure. Uh, so you know, let's let's make this as practical as possible. So if you're hiring someone, it's a tough labor market right now. What are you looking for? Are you looking for just those elements that are written on the resume that with those keywords, or if you're looking for someone who can navigate 
a world of artificial intelligence that wants, you know, which is really about asking questions and understanding prompts. Yeah. How do you find someone who's inquisitive? How do you find someone who maybe has traveled a lot, lived in different cultures? Those things oftentimes might not be on a resume. They might, but like looking for those experiences that signal other types of knowledge, skills, abilities, and even mindsets is really going to be more important than ever. So that's one thing. Okay. The other thing is everyone has, you know, leaders have existing teams. Are we, and usually I see this, are we, you know, the question is, are we really leveraging the strength of the team to its full capacity? So, you know, I was a quick example, uh, um, one of my clients, the former uh, chief marketing officer of the international business at Hershey, I asked her, about her own experiential intelligence and what allowed her to be successful. And I said, outside of your work experience, not on your resume. And she said, oh, that's easy. I play the violin. <laughs> I'm like, well, tell me a little bit more about that. And she said that she has, she growing up, she had to have intense focus, but that she was in a small orchestra and she had to at times take the lead, but also at times pull back and let the, the, the rest of the quote unquote team really come through and, and do hmm. what they do. And there was a lot of creativity in some of the compositions they were working on. So she's applied the same principles and her experience of being able to really be a driver and push forward, but also pull back and let the team do what they need to do in her work. And so yeah, that's, you know, she, she is leveraging that. Now the question is, how do we uncover those same types of experiences and the intelligence gained from them from our existing team members so that we can drive innovation or understand customer needs better because that individual has lived in a certain neighborhood or country or culture or whatever yeah. it is and really you know look at the whole of the team and appreciate those assets that exist that maybe have been flying, flying under the radar because we're just so focused on what we're focused on. Interesting. So how do you identify those from your existing team? Just get some conversational things going, kind of a, I know in kindergarten, we used to bring in some of our favorite things and, and share <laughs> our, our hobbies and things like that. But yeah, um, it, it can range. Uh, you know, I, in the, in my book, I have a whole assessment, but like, okay. forget the assessment, I'll boil it down. And I did this with a Fortune 1000 company uh, with a department that I was working with. They had multiple teams. I had people come in ready to share. This is a pre-work ex exercise. What are three experiences that significantly shaped you in your life that lead yeah. to, you know, how you operate today and it's you know, kind of the success of, of what you do today. So they're, they're walking in with three stories about their life. Some of them were business oriented, but a lot of them weren't. And so I paired people up. Um, and I created a group of six people at a table took those uh, three pairs at that table, for example, paired people up, they shared their stories. They uh, they extrapolated from each other what their strengths were, not, usually not mm -hmm. based on you know, their resumes. Then they got back into their tables of six, extrapolated from there the themes and understood the assets that that table had. And then we just looked across the tables and inventoried those things that the, the whole department had. And then we looked at the department's business strategy and said, okay, given the strategy, how do we leverage these assets? And people got to know each other better. People built trust. People sure. were able to understand kind of what the, the, the whole of the team and what the assets were, and then apply it to something really tangible about, you know, executing on the strategy. So <laughs> it doesn't have to be rocket science. And I think the hard part is the soft stuff is oftentimes the hardest stuff, especially for engineers and technology minded people. Yep. But the soft stuff is the differentiator. And, you know, we've seen it with Google's work on psychological safety and some other, you know, kind of team success factors. Those really qualitative conversations really help change the game for teams. Yeah. That's a very interesting approach. And like you said, it's it's not real technical, not real difficult. Well, I would imagine too, because I've been in a similar type of group, if I'm talking with somebody or a couple other people, and they kind of share some kind of a story and then how that impacts our work, then that's going to set off a light bulb in my mind that I hadn't thought of. It's like, well, I did something similar to that, or or that reminds me of my whatever event. So yeah, so to get everybody sharing those ideas and then people probably 
rediscover maybe some of the strengths that they had forgotten about or or maybe didn't think you know, somebody playing a violin might not think that applies to business, um, but it does. So. Well, well, that's absolutely right. And I'm going to take it one step deeper uh, because, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to understand this dimension. My view is vulnerability begets vul- more vulnerability and vulnerability, according to Google, is the secret sauce to creating psych- psychological safety, which is the secret mm. sauce to creating highly effective teams. So, okay. you know, and, it, and I told you, I'd tell you a little bit about my personal uh, story. Mm-hmm. I grew up uh, when my mother, when I was three, my mother developed schizophrenia. My father was rarely around. And by the time I was uh, 15 years old, we had moved 16 times. I grew up with mm. total ambiguity, a lot of trauma a lot of fear as a kid. Now I had to deal with and overcome some of the issues created from my life experience there, but also I eventually have embraced the fact that I can live with uncertainty. I can make decisions with very little data and there's some assets. Once I was able to overcome some of the, the challenges, I could recognize those assets and then help others also figure out how to leverage their own assets. And so you know, when I share my own story, usually I get more, you know, depth from others in return. And that right. cycle, if you take a little risk and you show that vulnerability, usually others will reciprocate. And that that depth is really the secret sauce for innovation and and teams. And trust. That, that's that's a way to build trust when you kind of show some of your vulnerability. That's interesting. So, so we've all got those stories and we've all got those experiences. Just need to think about how else they could apply. So that'd be a good reason to read the book, to see some of the other examples and, and see how that, how that can work. What, what are some of the big things you see with experiential, experiential intelligence coming in the, in the next few years, especially if companies become a little bit more open to this and read your book and want to adopt some of these principles? Well, you know, you you had asked about technology earlier. I know a lot of people listening are, are probably in, interested in technology. And, and, you know, if you look at artificial intelligence, um, my view about AI is that we're rapidly commoditizing IQ. So our mm-hmm. intellect is going to be commoditized um, by, by, by technology. So, you know, the different, and I think that's why a lot of people have some fear and trepidation around what's happening with AI is going to replace us. I think it is going to replace elements of our, our problem solving um, abilities and skills that we're not going to, you know, need to, to look to individuals for, we could look to tools for. Mm -hmm. So what does that leave us? emotional intelligence and experience. So like when you really look at the success factors of leadership in the future, it's a little bit more of the soft stuff. Now, let me anchor the experience side. So if you look at where the most successful people will be in using artificial intelligence is those who know how to create prompts, know how to ask questions, know how to navigate the, the interactions involved with drawing out the insights from artificial intelligence. Yeah. So I, I think that that is going to be, you know, the ability to to find people and tap into your own experience to ask questions and to use these tools will be important. The other thing I think is is scale. You know, how do you look across if you're in a larger organization? How do you look across the organization to find those pockets of innovation? Who people who have done things or experimented with things that others can benefit from and scale Mm -hmm. that using technology. So, you know, whether you're creating toolkits or business processes or digital platforms that scale what exists that are the strengths from people's experiences that other people can quickly leverage. That's another uh, opportunity. That's, that's something that I'm working on with my software company, Um, Praxy.com. But the idea is that there's pockets of innovation everywhere. How do you tap into that and share it? Okay. It's going to be interesting and and fun to watch as this becomes more popular and just as things change, like you said, they're they're always changing and they seem to be changing faster than ever. What's with the current work that you're doing in 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 different areas with with your own company and as an author as a speaker? What's the favorite part of your work? What do you love the most? 
I personally, because I do consulting and leadership development, and I've got the software company that works across industries, I like working with different people and cultures Mm -hmm. and organizations. And that includes, you know, different types of organizations, different organizations in different countries, whatever it is, so that I can help people, but also learn myself and have those experiences that cross organization, culture, cross geographic culture, give me insights into what makes people tick, what leads to successful leadership, what leads to successful innovation and organizational cultures. And and that's really what, what motivates me and drives me. Okay. That's exciting. It's fun to have, like me, I like to have the variety. I get the opportunity to work with uh, tech people in lots of different countries. So they have different and different types of uh, businesses and different types of products. So I get get to see a variety of of thinking, innovation techniques, and all that, which makes it fun for me because I learn something new every day from from the people I work with. So it's about so those. What, it is about those experiences. I mean, yeah. That's what you're that's what you're talking about. Yeah, that's true. Everything life's an experience, right? All of it. <laughs> yeah. So, so what's ahead for you, kind of, in your team for the next year, year and a half? What what are your big projects? Uh, I am uh, currently building out our our software platform to help scale a lot of what we're talking about, finding pockets of innovation from within specific industries or organizations Mm -hmm. and make those readily available as a scalable business processes and and best practices and strategy Mm -hmm. and innovation, manufacturing, whatever it is. Um, That's really um, a big area of focus of mine. Um, And then, you know, continuing to spread the word about experiential intelligence and working with um, leadership teams to really look at the next generation of how they can be effective in their work as leadership teams but then also as, you know, organizational leaders that are creating cultures of innovation that are based on digital technology, emerging technology, as well as, you know, kind of being good places for people to to live and work. Mm-hmm. Good. That's a good project and some good goals. <laughs> what I'm sure some of the listeners uh, want to get in touch with you or learn more. I will put a book, a link to your book in the show notes so they can find that easily. How else could they reach out to you if they have questions or want to learn more? Uh, my website, my personal website, where my book is uh, located, SorenKaplan.com, S-O-R-E-N-K-A-P-L-A-N.com. Okay. I'll get a link to that in the show notes also, so people can can find it easily. So it's a great discussion. I'm glad to have the opportunity to have you on to talk about your experience and the new book. And I look forward to reading it myself. I didn't get to it yet, but it's it's on my table, on my stack. Um, so thanks again. I know you're busy. And I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me and, and share your insights with the audience. It was a real pleasure, Steve. Thank you.